So you have the known or the unknown and its two elements, negative and positive. And you have the known and its two elements, negative and positive. And then you have the individual and its two elements, negative and positive. And the interaction between those categories makes up stories, fundamentally. And all the stories that you ever hear about how it is that you should live or shouldn't live are different juxtapositions of those characters and their interactions. And the more archetypal the story, the more clearly the case that structure is. So, for example, in the Thor movies, Loki and Thor are sons of Zeus, right? So Zeus is the great father, and he produces hostile brothers. And that's the same, that's echoed in Christian stories by God and Christ and Satan. It's the same idea. And Cain and Abel, and you see these hostile brother patterns everywhere. And that's because people have to contend with what opposes them. Not only outside in the world when they're contending against their opponents, some of whom are corrupt and deceitful, but also within themselves. When they're trying to set themselves straight and to keep at bay all those elements of their own character that seem to work at cross purposes to themselves. It's a very strange thing about people, you know. We can't just tell ourselves what to do. We're inhabited by all these strange sub-personalities that have a certain amount of autonomy and they're off doing whatever they want to at any given time and they're very difficult to bring under control. It's very hard to be the master of your own house. So I subdivided up reality for you in one way. <clears throat> and so for the time being we're, we're done with that. Now I want to subdivide reality up in another way because you can't understand what's going on in the heroic and shamanic initiations and in the worldview that's encapsulated there and the implication of that worldview for the understanding of phenomena like the unconscious and unconscious symbolism without looking at the world from one other perspective. So here, here's a, a decomposition of your computer, let's say. So first of all, we'll imagine your computer's working. And so then you might think, well, what is your computer when it's working? And then that's a hard question to ask because it's, well, your keyboard, because you're clicking on the keyboard in all likelihood, and then there's the screen, or there's what's on the screen, because you're not actually looking at the screen, right? You're looking at what's on the screen, and it isn't even clear where that is. But the computer, while you're using it, sort of collapses itself down into what you're watching on the screen and what you're interacting with. That's the computer. And then all of a sudden, poof, it stops working. So you have an emotional response to that, right? Like the monkey who's just seen a jaguar. It upsets you. And the reason it upsets you is because you actually don't have a clue about your computer. And it either works, well, some of you more than others. It either works, and then it's a computer, or it doesn't work. In which case, God only knows what it is, or what you're going to do about it. So, this is, this is a good example of how what you understand can collapse into what you don't understand. Because a computer turns out to be an unbelievably complicated thing. And it can fail for innumerable reasons. And if you want to fix it, then you have to take into account its insane complexity and start to piece it back together so that it starts to behave like the computer you want it to be instead of like a, you know, oblong, oblong rock. So, what do you have to do? Well, I represented the computer as that little black rectangle in the middle, and it's, I expanded it down one level. So your computer is obviously full of subcomponents, right, of all sorts. The boards and chips and all the little things inside the electronic things that all of which when they work you can ignore but when they don't work instantly constitute a whole nest of snakes and so any of those subcomponents could have gone wrong and then the subcomponents are made up of even smaller parts of course and any of those could go wrong and then underneath that there's the elemental properties that the micro parts have to contend with in order to function and sometimes well, sometimes weird things happen down there. So, I don't know if you know this or not, but computer chips have now got so small that there's only some probability that the electrons that are flowing along a given wire will actually be in that wire. Because the uncertainty principle specifies that well, electron is probably here, but it might also be somewhere else. And at small enough levels of resolution, or high enough le levels of resolution, that actually starts to become a problem. So the electrons can just get outside the wires, and that causes shorts. So probably your computer isn't failing because of some pathology at the quantum level of reality, but you never know. 
<laughs> micro part might be not working properly. A subcomponent might not be working properly. Ah, but there's other ways of, of, the pro of, of considering the problem too. You might say, this is the last time I ever buy a compact computer. And then what you're doing is you're attributing the cause of its failure to act like a computer to the brand. And then you might say, well, I bought one of those, I bought a computer from a from an economic system that's still somewhat pathological. So you might say, well, it's a Chinese part, for example. And as a consequence, the brand isn't reliable. And the reason the brand isn't reliable is because the economic system isn't reliable, and that's because the political system isn't reliable. So maybe the reason your computer doesn't function is because the political system that surrounds the manufacturer doesn't function well. So you end up with a cheap part, and it doesn't work. And so all of those, as soon as your computer stops being what it is, to you, which is the keyboard and the screen, or what's behind the screen, say, then all of a sudden it turns into all these other things that it could be, and in order to get it working like a computer again, or even to replace it, you have to contend with all of these other multiple levels of reality. So, there's two lessons from that. One is, well, that's why you get stressed when something stops working. It's because when it's working, it's doing what you want it to do, and that's what it is. The fact that it's doing what you want it to do defines what it is. But as soon as it stops working, God only knows what it is. You know, cars are like that, except they're even worse, because with a computer, you can usually just throw it away and replace it, and, you know, maybe that's a couple hundred dollars, but maybe something went wrong with your car. Well, that's a complete bloody catastrophe, because not only does it not function as a car, now it's just a hunk of metal, but you have to take it to someone who you don't know to fix it, and who knows what they're going to do with it. Like, they might fix it, but they might not, or they might fix something that actually isn't wrong, or they might overcharge you, or, I mean, there's a whole rat's nest that's associated with having your car break down, and that tangles you right up. It's funny, because as soon as the car breaks down, then you have to contend with the whole culture that surrounds the car, and any of the, all of the pathology that might be embedded in that culture. Okay, so, one way of thinking about this a computer's like that. It manifests itself on multiple levels simultaneously, but so do people, and so do all other phenomena, but we'll stick with people for now. You know, there's a level at which you're phenomenologically apparent, and that's the level at which we all see each other. I can see your front, but not the back of you or the sides of you, and I can see your outside, but not your inside, and I can see you... With, I can't see your family that surrounds you, although if I was a chimpanzee and we were looking at each other, and I knew you were a high-status chimpanzee, my body would detect your family because I would know that if I messed with you, they'd come after me. And so I would perceive your nesting in the social group, even though you know, you'd sort of manifest yourself to me as, as just a body. But, but my, my, my physiology would be smarter than that. So 